Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. Today, we have a special treat. Scott Derrickson is an accomplished movie director, writer, and producer responsible for films such as The Exorcism of Emily Rose, Sinister, and most recently, the Marvel movie Doctor Strange. Scott's also an extremely thoughtful guy with strong ideas about the craft of filmmaking, the history of cinema, and the relationship between movies and other art forms. So we have a wide-ranging conversation, which basically falls into two parts. The first thing we did was we sort of deconstructed the making of a big blockbuster superhero movie, using Doctor Strange as an example. So we lay out the whole thing from the initial pitch, the meeting where you talk to the studio and see if you're on the same wavelength, through pre-production, shooting, reshoots, and finally post-production. You'll learn, for example, why the cast and crew, especially Benedict Cumberbatch, thought it was really important to shoot on location in Nepal, and why digital photography is okay for most shots in a big movie like this, but why you have to switch to film once you're outside in the sunshine. These are things that, as a theoretical physicist, I'm not generally up on, so I really learned a lot from this conversation. Then in the second part, we'll talk more broadly about the idea of cinema and film and what it means, the role of themes and stories in filmmaking. Many of Scott's films have been horror movies, and we talk about the unique role of that particular genre in evoking a certain kind of human reaction, how that relates to the existence of evil and everyday human anxieties, whether or not you have supernatural boogeyman in your movie or not. We also come from different perspectives about the fundamental nature of reality. Scott is a Christian. I am a naturalist. And so we talk about how one's worldview influences the story one tries to tell in a movie. And Scott says the answer is a lot. (laughs) He says it would be very, very different movie maker if he suddenly converted to atheism tomorrow, but it's unlikely to happen. We also agree, though, that the world is more interesting with people coming from different perspectives. So Scott says he doesn't want me to convert uh, to his religious viewpoint. Only afterward that I realize that maybe this means I'm going to be condemned to eternity eternal damnation. Uh, Happily, I'm not so sure about that, and I don't even believe it myself, so I'm not really worried. But it's one of the things that you have to take into account when you talk about these big picture issues. Anyway, this was truly a great conversation. I'm sure you're going to enjoy it. Remember that if you're so inclined, you can support Mindscape on Patreon, patreon.com slash Sean M. Carroll. We love our supporters. Thanks so much. And whether you're a Patreon pledger or not, thanks very much for listening. So let's go. Scott Derrickson, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. So good to be here. Thanks. Now, I do want to talk about big picture stuff, you know, themes and cinema and all these great things. I know that you have lots of opinions on, but I thought let's set the stage and get into it by being a little bit more down to earth. So you're, you've directed Doctor Strange. Yep. Big blockbuster Marvel movie. Um, when I see movies like this these days, when we all see them, one of the things is at the end of it, the credits are very, very long. Yes. <laughs> it's a gigantic operation to, uh, shepherd something like this from start to finish. So why don't you, for the audience who are not necessarily cinephiles, um, just explain like what it's like from you know the initial pitch for the idea to opening night. I mean, for a movie that size, from the original pitch to opening night is probably usually about two years, you know, for mm-hmm. a movie of, of that size. Um, and the script process uh, goes on for a good you know, six to nine months before hard, what they call hard prep, hard pre-production begins. So that there's always that, you know, six to nine month period where you're getting the scripts written, rewritten, uh, putting it in, in shape where you're breaking it down and getting it ready to shoot. Um, And then that process for a movie this size always continues through prep and through production. You never stop rewriting. You never (laughs) stop rewriting. And by the way, that's that's there are plenty of directors who work that way anyway. You know, um, Stanley Kubrick. I'm reading the book about him and his relationship with Arthur Arthur C. Clarke, and uh, and he was rewriting 2001 
all the way through posts. I mean, he was just rewriting. My impression is his relationship with all of the authors he adapted was touchy. <laughs> well, yes, but given, especially given the fact that he said only bad movies make or only bad books make good movies. <laughs> I think that may may have uh, uh, been a reason why the relationship was tu- was was always touchy. Um, but it was certainly in this. Th- that, I highly recommend that book, by the way. Okay. Yeah, that, the relationship that the two of them had. Uh, is so fascinating and the book is really dense, really well researched. And I know a lot about that movie and I didn't know anything in that book. But anyway, so back to your question, um, then you've got three major phases of filmmaking, which is pre-production. I think the longest and most important phase um, because that's when you're really designing everything that be, will become the physical reality of the movie. Well, actually, I don't want to pass too quickly over the pitch. Yeah, you know, sure. Originally, yeah, like, you know, did, I mean, obviously, Doctor Strange is a pre-existing idea, so yeah. it's a different kind of thing. There's, there's all sorts of different ways that a movie can come about, but did you have an angle on the movie and then go to Marvel, or did they come to you and say, hey, do you want to think about this? That's a good question. They, they, what they did is they, they uh, had a pool of directors that in their minds were possibilities, and it was a large pool. I mean, dozens of directors that, that they liked. And, who, and, and at this point, Marvel was beginning its really big expansion, right. which has taken, taken place in just the last few years. And, and, uh, and they had approached me years ago about Thor, and I just told them, I, I wouldn't know how to make not Thor your superhero. Me. Yeah, not my superhero. <laughs> just a, you know, and I don't think there's any superhero that I would have felt personally drawn to, except for Doctor Strange. So when I heard they were making Doctor Strange, I I felt immediately like this is this is something I could definitely do. And the way the process worked was they brought me in along with again dozens of other directors, and they had a short document sign an NDA, a non-disclosure agreement, and you read this document. And I was very impressed with the document because the things that were in there were essentially uh, what they felt should and shouldn't be a Doctor Strange movie. It was very basic, but, okay. it, but it lined up perfectly with mine, which was, you know, they, they really liked the, the, uh, the, the deep ideas and the philosophical overtones of, of the right. Doctor Strange comics. They, they, there were aspects of, of uh, the, the Lovecraftian monsters that they weren't interested in, at least in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in an early film. And I, was, I felt like they understood the character, this lonely, uh, isolated uh, character who is uh, different than other superheroes because of his relationship to other dimensions, not in, mm-hmm. a, not in the scientific sense, but in, the, in yeah. the Marvel comic universe sense. And, and that they were looking for a way to open up you know, the, the MCU uh, the Marvel comic universe, the Marvel cinematic universe to a multiverse, you know, where, where you're actually dealing literally with other dimensions, unlike Osgard, which is out there in our own universe. Literally somewhere. somewhere. So, yeah. somewhere. You can fly there if you've got a, if you've got a means to get there. You I know, was so. actually part of the um, uh, science advising for Thor. When oh they, yeah. When it came which, out. which was a huge aspect of that movie. Right. And I think, and, and I think because they did that so well in, in that movie, um, I, I think that they recognized that when it came to Doctor Strange, it was okay to let magic be magic. Exactly. And I think that the part of it was Thor, despite being a god in some sense, right. like we're going to portray him as pretty grounded. We think he's a god because he's super powerful, but it has to make sense. And, you know, almost intentionally leaving the magic thing for later in the series. And that's where you could do it. Right. Because if, be, as much as I love and respect science, I don't think that a, an approach of trying to scientifically validate the mysticism of Doctor Strange would be interesting no. to me and would feel like a disrespect to the comics. Yeah, and totally. so, so and the fact that that's not where they were coming from was, was great. So I immediately uh, thought, I think I'm the right guy to do this movie. I mean, I felt a real deep conviction about it. And I decided uh, that I would put everything I could into getting that job. And I I just decided that I was going to uh, work harder to try to get that job than anything I had ever done before um, in terms of efforts to get hired for things. Uh, This is obnoxious, but I've said it publicly before. I spent (laughs) $42,000 of my own money on a presentation. Wow. uh, Which was the eighth of eight meetings. I I bet you made it back, didn't you? (laughs) <laughs> uh, well, not only did I make it back, but one of the first things when they hired me is they said, we have to buy that presentation oh. <laughs> because we, we need to own all that material. So, so that was immediately, uh, that was my first, even before I had a, a directing deal, I, right. I, I got all that money back. But it was, it was um, for me, it was, uh, it was coming from a very personal place. It wasn't so much that I, I mean, I was excited to make a Marvel movie, but I've never been somebody who's been enamored 
uh, by big budget filmmaking as opposed to small budget filmmaking. You know, they 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 have they all have their pros and cons as a as a, a as an artist to work on. Um, they all have their pros and cons as films to watch. Um, but in this case, I just felt like this is a movie that I think I could do better than maybe anyone else. Right. Like I'm I'm a right I'm the right fit for this, and that became my focus was to show them why I was the, the right fit. You know? Yeah. Yeah. And so, so you did that and they picked you. They did. And so then you can start uh, this wonderful process that you started. And so pre-production, I mean, there was, uh, there's scripts being written and I presume there's a certain Hollywood thing, right? Where there's some people who get credit for the script, but there's probably more voices that came into actually. Yeah. There was, in, in this case, there were, you know, uh, the two credited writers were John Spates, who wrote the first draft, um, who's a mutual friend, I believe yep. you know him. And, uh, and, and he was one that, that we picked, you know, based on, um, his original screenplay for, uh, Prometheus, which was called, I think alien engineers was brilliant. You know, that screenplay was so good. Yeah. And I would just, oh, had been a fan of uh, his, his original script for passengers was brilliant. Um, and, uh, and we hired him, so he did the first draft, and then myself and Cargill, my writing partner, uh, who's here sitting next to me, just listening in. Just hi, Cargill. You know, <laughs> hi, everybody. That's Cargill. Uh, follow so him we, on Twitter. We, he has a great Twitter feed. He's yeah. Follow Cargill on on Twitter. That's that's. Uh, I'm here to pump uh, <laughs> Cargill's Twitter feed. Um, but yeah, we we came in and rewrote uh, for quite a long time. I mean, we must have done you know, 20 drafts, 25 drafts, something like that. And, uh, and then there were some other writers who came in and took passes on it, um, to add humor, to, you know, try fixing some structural problems that we were ha- having. Dan Harmon did a quick pass on it, which, which, uh, we, there wasn't much that he wrote that ended up in the script, but his analysis of where we were having problems in the movie was so spot on. Right. So he was, he was actually a critical component in, in that movie you know, eventually working. I'm finishing up, you know, writing a book, a popular book on quantum mechanics. And I always send out my books to be read, my drafts by other people. And sometimes they go like, no, chapter three needs to be chapter eight. And I'm like, of course. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah exactly. That. Well, and, and, and I, that was, and that, so that whole process working with, um, with uh, uh, a budget this size is very common. It's not, it's not so common. Sometimes if you're working with, with uh, a, a true auteur director, you know, they'll, they'll do everything on their own. Um, and it works out and sometimes it doesn't, but I, I, I don't mind the process of, of working hand in hand of rewriting other people's scripts or having my scripts rewritten as long as the people are talented and, you know, and I meanwhile, there's like a million things going on, casting, yes. uh, set design, it all happens all at the same time. Right. And know? are you kind of the boss or partly the boss of all that? Um, yeah, it's like, you know you're the you're the captain of the ship, yeah. and so everything goes through you, and and uh, everybody uh, has to come to you, you know, for information about what you're looking for, and you give that information. And there's a tremendous amount of delegating, clearly, um, but you uh, you ultimately are responsible as being the only person who's holding it all together in your in your head. Yeah, you know, and 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 a big part of that process becomes um, helping. For me, it's two on Doctor Strange in particular. It was really two things. I mean, one of them was making it really clear to all the major department heads what the target of the movie was, what it was that we were going to, going to be making, right. and and for me, it was an emphasis upon um, this is a, a mind bending, mind trip action movie about a, a, a soul personality, about one guy overcoming himself, getting past his own. I mean, at some point, at this point. The Marvel Cinematic Universe is mature, right? Right. Like you have to look for ways to distinguish. Yes, and you have to you have to say this is not this is unlike these other films in this way. We but we I do like this sensibility, you know, for for uh, you know for Marvel. It, for, for example, when it came to performances, you know, some Marvel films are more um, uh, over the top and 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 cartoony uh, or, or comic booky, if that, if I can use that phrase. And I, for Doctor Strange, because we were going to be venturing out into such fantastical terrain, I actually wanted the performances to be very realistic, right. you know, so that was part of the casting process, which is, you know, why we got such serious actors, you know, to play pretty dramatic roles, Rachel McAdams and Tilda Swinton and Chiwetel Ejiofor and, you know, these Oscar winning yeah. people and, and of course, Benedict and, and probably, you know, 
that sensibility was something that everyone needs to understand. You know, so as a director, you have to make certain um, uh, a certain basic vision of what the movie is going to be clear to everybody, so that they understand the sensibility behind it. Um, and and I think uh, uh, that's so helpful. And then encourage them. My whole process for for sure is encourage them to bring me better ideas than mine. Right. You know, and 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 they always do. You know, and when, are when you doing a lot of recruiting of actors? I mean, sometimes they want the role really badly. Other times they're they're <laughs> oh, yeah. hard to get. <laughs> no, no, no. In in the case of the major roles for Doctor Strange, I mean, we went after every one of those actors, you know, for, for specific reasons. Um, Benedict was our first choice. We wanted him. We, and, and it, we talked about, um, other possibilities for a very short time. Um, but we, uh, Kevin Feige, who, you know, runs Marvel, you really make the movie with him. You know, he's, he's not just a studio head. He's very hands-on. He's really in there with you without a lot of middlemen. And, uh, and he and I quickly, agreed that that he was the right guy and i flew to london immediately and met with benedict and the timing didn't work out uh because he was doing hamlet uh in Uh london and so then i had to start looking for other actors and nothing was i mean i met with amazing actors but in the end it was just like it's got to be benedict (laughs) and and kevin to his credit you know went for the second time back to disney and said we really want Benedict, so we we need to move the release date. So we moved the release date from the summer. That's a huge deal. It's yeah. a huge deal because yeah. the fall is not as lucrative. Right. It's just not. And so we we probably could have made even more money uh, in terms of opening day and that sort of thing, but we wouldn't have made you know the movie that we made because it's so centered around Benedict. And at the same time, you're deciding uh, what the sets are going to look like. Like I remember, I don't know if you saw this little video you can find on YouTube, the Russo Brothers did a video about um, Infinity Ward. They just analyzed like a little 30-second scene, right? And it was where Thor appears with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And it's, it's a great scene, but it, it just impresses on you know someone like me, who is not in the business, how much effort goes into those 30 seconds, like with the lighting coming from particular ways and the postures of every actor and which thing you're going to do. And this is all going in your mind in this pre-production yeah. phase, right? Yeah. And you, you and, and the breakdown of all the different elements that have to go into um, how to shoot those particular sets. And, and, and that th- th- this is why the pre-production phase is the most critical phase, you know, because you've got to have enough time, first of all, to dream it up and, 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 and then to, uh, to thrash it and, and criticize it in your mind and think about what, what could be better. I think one of the main reasons why so many big blockbuster movies are not great is because you have enough money to afford your first idea. Ah. And, um, That's a good point. and your first idea is rarely your right. best idea. Right. And so it takes a, a, a real, uh, conscious discipline to, um, to come up with these ideas, but then to be very harsh and critical of them. And, and to their credit, I think it's one of the things that Marvel does better than anybody. You know, they are, they, they are not ever impressed with their own work. And so everything is always being criticized by everybody all the time, yeah. which can, as a director, can become a little painful <laughs> at times, you know. Um, but it but sounds it, like being a scientist, actually. Yeah, it, it, in very- <laughs> no, it's the same. It's the same same yeah. idea, which is you, you know, if you want to get to the to um, the best version of something, or to the truth of something, or to to an ideal of some kind, you know, you're not going to get there uh, without um, admitting to. Uh, all your shortcomings and all your failures and all the things that actually don't work and don't quite line up. And, you know, and it's true of writing as well. You know, the phrase that we would always use in working on Dr. Strange between myself and Cargill and particularly John Spates was, uh, we're doing a lot of hand waving in this scene, you know, and, and the hand waving of we're all pretending like this works in a way it actually doesn't work. That's literally what physicists say to each other. You're hand waving this, you know, yeah. this particular question. Yes. Right? And, 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 and it's the same thing. And because so much of filmmaking you know, is like, I love the fact that the Academy is the Academy of Arts and Sciences, you know, because there's so much of, of, you know, what you're in service of is art, but so much of the actual making of a movie is science. So much of it is just physical. It's practical. It's, you know, and, and even down to things in the case of Dr. Strange, and this gets still to your initial question about communicating with department heads. One of the things that I was 
adamant about from the beginning that was probably the hardest concept to get across to people was that we were going to have these incredible, fantastical sequences of the, you know, mind trip through, you know, through multi dimension, multiple dimensions, and and New York being turned into this Escher esque <laughs> puzzle, and 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 the people fighting in, in their astral forms, you know, all that. But my mantra was, I want the physical materials of what is on screen, the physical material that, that the audience is looking at to feel tactile and real and like something they can relate to, as opposed to say the emperor's, you know, amorphous lightning bolt finger lights. Like Mm -hmm. we don't have a reference for anything that looks like that in our experience. You know, lightning is sharper edged than that. Yeah. You know, so it's even Tesla light is 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 more defined than that. So I was always coming back to that, like no amorphous light, no no. Uh, I don't want to represent magic as being this. I want it to be so. So for example, when they create the mantras, you know, that's very crispy, sparkly material that looks like the sparklers you grew up playing yeah. with and looks like fire and, lo- and it looks you you feel like you have a sense of what it would feel like to touch that material right so you wanted the distance between this crazy magic stuff and our human experience to be as short as possible exactly because i think that that as soon as it's not as soon if, if, if you try to merge if you try to communicate magic i felt and i still feel that if you try to communicate magic with with uh, physical representations that have no human context in terms of their tactile uh, your visual tactile relationship to them in your own mind, then you're create you're using something um, uh, unrelatable to try to communicate something unrelatable. Right. And I really feel that the best way to get the audience to feel a sense of awe is if you're showing them something unrelatable, but everything that's actually in the frame has a physical relatability yeah. to their experience. Yeah. Like that was a bit, and that's everything. I mean, it just took me, you know. <laughs> like several minutes just to try to get the concept across to, to you. And, and it's, you can see how that's a difficult thing then to get across to a farm of, you know, 50 visual effects operators. Well, is it you the know, same thing it, where, it, where, you're, where you're saying about, you know, the first idea is not the best one in this CGI ready age, it's maybe too easy to just make some amorphous lightning bolts do all the work. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Right. And, and, uh, it was, it was a constant struggle to, um, you know, reject things. And I think that at times it was very frustrating for the visual effects people because they, they, they aren't, weren't used to that kind of scrutiny. And, and I was pointing them, I was saying, you know, we were doing these things that are so fantastical and no one's done it before. And, and, uh, and we're, we're, there's no precedent for the, the, the visual thing that we're doing, but it can't, it can't look unreal. Right. <laughs> it's a tough, <laughs> yeah, so, that's a tough challenge. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, so it was, right but, there. but they, but, but they, they did really get behind it. Like they, I think that once they, once I managed to communicate that at a, at a deep enough level, something, something sort of kicked in and it was very, it was industrial light, industrial light magic and, and a company called Luma and a couple others, you know, they, the, the head people who were working on the project for those companies became very excited at the prospect, you know, and, and suddenly realized that they were going to get to create some things that, that, um, we're going to be boundary pushing for them. Right. You know, and that's, and that's that's a message across that. And that's, that's what you want. You want them to get excited that they get to be co-creators that they get, they get to, bring I wanted them to bring me things that superseded my ideas but I kept kicking them back because it was like it's not that kind of magic it's not you know I don't I, it has to feel physically tactile to the audience they've got to have a, some way of relating to every piece of visual material they're looking at Okay, and at some point, uh, production starts. Yeah. There you are. Where did, where did you start? What was the first thing you did? The first thing we did is uh, Nepal. We shot in Kathmandu, Nepal. And, and uh, we'd gone there th- three times. I think we did an early scout there before the big earthquake. And then the earthquake occurred, and we did a second scout. Um, and uh, it was, uh, there, w- there was a real question about safety. Uh, uh-huh. About working there um, because uh, you know if, if another quake happened, you know, and it was it was there were huge piles of rubble everywhere, and some of the sets that we had picked were destroyed. Wow! Uh, I didn't hear um, that. So it was it was a but but it was a pretty major decision. And Benedict, to his credit, sort of led the charge in saying that we we have to shoot here now. 
Like we have to, like they need it. They need, they need, they need to be Nepal to be represented because tourism, you know, it's a third world country and, right. and, and tourism is one of their primary sources of income and tourism just, you know, just vanished after the earthquake. And, and he really felt like, uh, this is a special place. He had history there. He'd been there when he was younger and he said, we have to shoot here now because it's a, it's a moral good. And, and, you know, it's a, we'll, we'll find a way to make it all safe. Right. And uh, everybody got behind that. It was great. great. Yeah. 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 And how long does the actual shooting take overall? Uh, with the Marvel movie, shooting days are usually around 80 to 85 days, you know, which is not much. I mean, I was, I was ask, does it feel rushed? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> and, 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 but they have, their, they have very good reasons for doing it, I think, because I think that, um, you know, for example, my, my first assistant director who uh, had just come off Spectre, uh, the James Bond movie, that movie was 123 shooting days, you know, and I made Doctor Strange in like 85. And, uh, and, but what it does is when you know that your production time is so compressed, it just makes everybody raise their game. Right. Because when you get the reality of the schedule in front of you and you realize on these on this week we have to accomplish all of this, everybody just work, everyone works harder. And and I, I think that there is um, uh, a lot of truth to it was Orson Welles who said the absence of boundaries is the enemy of art. And uh, mm-hmm. and I really believe that's true, which which you need, I think, a measure of pressure uh, and limitation in order to facilitate the highest measure of creativity. I think Robert Frost had the famous quote about, you know, would he ever write free verse? And he says, it's like playing tennis without a net, right? Like it's, <laughs> right. Not, it's not fun anymore. <laughs> right, 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 exactly. So, so I, th- I think that they, they, uh, um, th- there's a real method to, to Marvel's uh, approach to that. Um, but they also work with the understanding that there, there's almost certainly going to be a sizable amount of reshooting. Well, yeah. I was going to ask, so I presume they're doing some special effects work while you're shooting uh, th- there must be an enormous amount of effort just to put together what you've shot on are yeah. you shooting digitally or yeah, yeah well we actually in Kathmandu we shot all of that on film I I, okay. I, I, I I am a big believer in digital photography I you know it's certainly it's not just the future it's it's here it's like what everybody works on with the exception of a few auteurs like Tarantino and Chris Nolan who can afford you know to shoot all of their their films on on actual film but I've yet to see still a uh, daylight exteriors look great on right. digital. I just think daylight exteriors, you know, have, have a quality, even the best work that I've seen still has a quality that, that pales so to film. And so we did, we did, I did, was able to convince everybody that we needed to shoot Catman It's an interesting and, science and question because there's no reason in principle why it couldn't look as good. It's just two different ways of recording photons landing on your, you know, detector somehow. But <sighs> yeah, but, and it, but but I think something it, about film. I, I agree. Yeah. Know, there's something that that makes it feel more real. It makes it feel more real, and I think that it, it, it has to do with um, with our experience of of the specificities of sunlight. And again, it's like cloud cover. If it's a cloud cover day, like we did digital exteriors on Sinister and thank God there was cloud cover when we shot those <laughs> because they look great. Right. It all looks great. That, 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 the, the differential between, um, you know, film and, and digital when it comes to, you know, uh, cloud cover days is in my opinion, negligible. It's not that important, yeah. but daylight exteriors, when you're dealing with sunlight on people's faces or the, shooting the actual sky itself, the, the difference is, is, Enormous. I mean, so enormous that for me, it always pulls me out of a movie when I'm looking at, at digital daylight exteriors. They just they just don't feel real. And when you start with the reshoots, are the reshoots something? I mean, it's planned in presumably to the schedule. And is it is, is it mostly because you say this scene isn't working or we could do it better? What makes you go to a reshoot? Uh, well, what what you do is you put the movie together, and and most of the visual effects are not being done yet because you want to have the movie in relatively good shape before you start building all those visual elements. So the, the okay. post-production process is when you build most of the effects. So there's a lot of green screen in that first cut. And and uh, um, and what you really need to do is get it together and get it in front of people quickly, you know? And uh, it, whether at first it's, you know, five people, 10 people, and then get, get a small little in-house crew of, 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 you know, 50 strangers to watch it. And and you, it, you will learn very 
uh, soon and, 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 and painfully like it or not, <laughs> what doesn't work, yeah. you know, and what does work and what doesn't work. And you, you get a good idea of, okay, here's, here's what our problems are. And, uh, and, and that begins the process of start. You immediately start to plan, okay, what are we going to need to do, to be different, to make, to solve some of these problems. Now, occasionally even a big movie, um, like Mar- a Marvel movie, uh, doesn't need much of that. I believe they only did a few days of reshoots for the Avengers, for the first Avengers. That movie just came in, everything worked, you know? Um, that's rare even for an, you know, a small independent film. Right. You know, I mean, I, we did no reshoots on Sinister that we didn't need them. Um, that's rare. Yeah. You know, it was a $3 million movie. But uh, on Doctor Strange, we definitely did. But we also knew that we would because we knew that we were um, struggling with certain things, you know, still in the screenplay while, while we were making it. And uh, the surprising thing is what does work that you didn't think would work <laughs> and what doesn't work that you assumed would work. You know, it's always, it's yeah. always a, a illuminating. I think, I think filmmaking is a bit like baking, you know, okay. where if you're a, if you're a chef and especially if you're a world-class chef, you are an expert at, at understanding, you know, if I put these ingredients together and I put the, you know, but you got to do that. You got to do it. You got to do that the first time, you know, once. Right. And, and, and filmmaking is like creating a recipe for the first time. And you think know so many things about how it's going to work, but then it goes into the oven and what comes out is what's going to come out. <laughs> you know what I mean? And when it oh, comes yeah. out, it's going to come out and surprise you in, in some way. It might be way better than you thought. It probably will not be as good as you thought. I've had some dishes in fancy restaurants that uh, clearly should have been tasted before they came out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there's a, there's a, a component of, of, I think um, you put all the ingredients in, you, you make all the hard choices you do try, try to make, you tr- in, in, in your mind as a director, you've made a perfect film. You've, you've visualized right. everything. Yeah. You, you see it all, but then when the actual thing is there, you, you, ha- you have to come to realize the things that don't work. And then how much time is spent between the end of the reshoots and opening night? Uh, we had a very short post-production schedule I mean, there's because the score of, yeah. and there's, you know, because the of, because of Benedict's, effects. um, schedule and having moved it to the fall, we still had, uh, we had a long prep, which again, I think was the most important thing, but we had a short post. Um, and, and the result was a kind of crazed panic because we had to get all those reshoots done and get the visual effects done on time. Right. My, uh, um, my visual effects team was so smart and that they hired multiple houses, big houses to all start work at the same time, which you usually don't really do. You usually rely heavily on a single house, a single visual effects house. So that process for us, I think was only like four months, you know, typically it's going to be more like six or seven months. And there, I mean, there's a deadline that is not fungible, right? Like it's yeah. staring at you. Oh yeah. Place. And yeah, I mean, movies of this size, you know, work from their release dates backwards. Right. You yeah. start the process <laughs> Uh, reverse engineering from the day that the movie's going to come out. Are you fiddling with it right up to the last second? The film? Yeah. Uh, let me put it this way. Uh, <laughs> my final work on Doctor Strange was at around 12.30 or 1 in the morning um, when I finished color timing, which is the last thing you do. You finish the actual color timing of the master print so that when, when you watch it, when you watch the finished color timing version that's the finished movie. The sound is all mixed. You've done all the work there is to do. It, you're finished. That's it. I finished that at 1230 at night and was on a plane at six that morning. So five and a half hours later, I was on a plane to Hong Kong to start the press junket. <laughs> so yes, <laughs> I, it, yeah. I was literally. Was uh, it on working. a thumb drive? I mean, <laughs> where was this movie? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, the, 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 it would, this was all, uh, you know, on the Disney lot and, okay. you know, it's all, it yeah. was all in those, in those studios. And, and, uh, we really did, that's unusual, you know, the, the, the degree to which we just needed every last second. And that's where, when I was working seven days a week and yeah, sure. 18 hour days for months, no time for podcasting, no though. time for podcasting. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and it's, it's, it, it's exhausting, but very exhilarating because that post process is the most fun. It, is it? Oh okay. yes. Just editing all post production is so much fun. Do all directors believe that or do different directors? I have think that most fun? directors 
probably prefer editing to other I think that's probably the I think the majority of us feel that way because you get to see all the work come together it's another phase of writing you're still getting to right. write the movie and it's 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 as creative as writing definitely more creative in my opinion than production um, but production is the worst I mean production is just you know grueling it's just production so, in the sense of like making sure the craft services gets paid and stuff or no produ- production meaning uh, just working those long hours and, yeah, okay. and the physical demand. I mean, what people really don't understand about making a movie this size is the physical yeah. toll that it takes. The physical demand on you is, is pretty extraordinary. Yeah. You know, I mean, you, you really do enter. They, people compare it to uh, war, which is the most ridiculous analogy. That's probably like, too far. Yeah, yeah. We, 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 <laughs> we eat, we eat craft, you know, we eat catered food and, uh, and, and sleep in warm beds every night and we're getting paid huge amounts of money. But otherwise, Relatively it's just, few it's, casualties. And, and, and nobody dies, but it's just like war. <laughs> but it is, like, it is kind of like joining the army. You know, it is it is that kind of boot camp, uh, yeah. boot camp just brutal. This is not uh, for the faint of heart, you right. know. And and you you really do have to watch what you eat and drink and 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 man, manage your sleep habits. And because if you don't, uh, the, the moving train that you're running in front of will mow you over. <laughs> well, that's why I you know I I can imagine personally. Uh, writing a movie script someday. I can never even imagine directing a movie. It just sounds like so much stuff is going on. It must take a very special kind of personality to say, like, that's what I want to do. I want to be in a thing where there's so many different failure modes <laughs> that could go wrong yes, around me. Yeah. And I want to live with that. Is this what you wanted to do from the start? Yeah, it is. Um, uh, for, for me, it was, uh, and I think still is, a twofold thing. You know, part of it is just, I'm, I'm, I have a talent for it. I have a knack for it. And I think I, I felt that that was going to be the case when I was even in high school, you mm-hmm. know, just w- putting together little super eight films and stuff like that. I just felt like I had a knack for understanding film language and I'd watched, I grew up in a family that watched so many movies. So I understood movies in a way that I think people my age typically don't, or at least didn't then. I think now it's much more common, you know, people are watching so many films growing up. Right. Um, but I think that, that, what I love about directing, but the actual experience of directing is to, you know, be, do everything in the service of a piece of, of artistic entertainment that's going to be seen by millions of people and to feel the responsibility of, I get to have a couple hours of their hard earned life, of their rest time, their, their hard earned money is going to be spent on a Friday night to go with their girlfriend or wife or family, or whatever, and watch this movie I want them to have the best time of their week, right. you know, and, and that, that, that's always there. And I want them to have something human and I want them to have a human experience and, 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 and have fun and be, and be amazed by it. And I want them to remember it and, and possibly watch it again and love it as a part of their, of their life, you know? And so you start with that and that's the goal. That's what you're in service of. It's that, that's a very, there's a real altruistic, I think, truth to that. But then, in the action of actually doing it, the satisfaction for me is that it demands usage of every single thing I'm good at. Mm. Like every, my ability to communicate, my leadership skills, my salesmanship, uh-huh. you know, mm. along with my love for film language, my understanding of, of uh, cinema history, um, my ability to write, like all is to be able to utilize and feel like you're in a profession where you are utilizing everything that you are really good at. It's all being utilized at the highest level that's the ultimate job for anyone yeah it's you fulfilling know? in that sense it's fulfilling in that sense you know flannery o'connor was asked you know why do you write these quirky little stories about freaks these short stories about freaks and her answer was because i'm good at it <laughs> <laughs> and i just thought that should be everybody's that's answer yeah. that's, that should be everybody's answer to why they do what they do you know because if you're if you're good at it and you love it that's your right. calling that's what you should do and you have to do it though within this framework that we call hollywood yeah. right like i mean tell Tell, tell us a little bit about your, your fitting in with the whole Hollywood superstructure. Movies are obviously a big part of it, but business is a big part of it. Yeah. Egos are a big part of it and so forth. Well, I think that, that I've been fortunate, you know, because I've, I've managed to work for very, a lot of difficult people, you know, and, and even people who are notoriously difficult within Hollywood. You know, I worked for the Weinsteins for years and, and, uh, 
And I think that I survived a lot of the people I worked for in the past <laughs> and, and survived in a way a lot of artists didn't, right. you know, and, uh, and a lot of good artists didn't. So I think that um, my survival skills are strong, you know, that, there was that. But I, I, th- I think that it was also um, uh, my ability to sell. My dad was a car dealer. You know, and oh, I didn't know yeah, that. my dad owned a, a couple dark car dealerships when I was in high school. He lost, he got sick and lost all of his money uh, when I was in college. But, but I worked as a car salesman for him, and and I've always credited my work in in as a car salesman uh, to I, th- I think my talents as a filmmaker is is what it is. But I think that my ability to navigate the waters of Hollywood and to actually put together a career and to keep working has so much to do with my ability to sell because you're always selling an idea. You're selling a a script, a pitch. Um, You're selling yourself to to your crew members. You're selling yourself to the studios to get jobs. You're selling yourself, you know, in marketing the movie. I mean, that's such a big part of the job. To the actors to listen to you and you tell them to do something. For sure. And by the way, so much of that is like so much of what make, makes me an effective director was understanding that as it went in sales, any, you know, I, you come to understand you can't talk to every customer the same way. Your job is to figure out who are they, how do they need to be communicated with because that's your job, you know? And so in this, and actors are the same way. They're all powerfully emotional people, but they all need to be spoken to in different ways, depending on who they are. And so you have to learn to do that. And, and I think that, that, um, I think so much of, uh, of, of Hollywood success, you know, demands either, incredible luck just you know unparalleled raw genius or an ability to sell right you maybe know, you're, two you're, of those three would yeah, be helpful yeah two, if you have two of those three then then you know then you're in really good shape then you're stanley kubrick <laughs> yeah that's right <laughs> so you uh have done the big blockbuster superhero thing i actually before i leave that topic uh how hard is it to keep the humanity, the character narrative strength in a movie that is just that big. I'm really, I'm really glad that you asked that question because I, I think that it is the greatest challenge of directing a film that big. And I think that it's the number one reason why you see big Hollywood blockbuster movies that don't work. Um, Because a lot of times they worked in a script phase in a way that they don't work by the time they reach the screen. And so often what I can feel from those movies is that the director, you know, was not able some for whatever reason. Maybe it was his fault, maybe not, or her fault. But the that for some reason that human emotional story um, was not was not uh, remaining central during the production because the production was so demanding. And that in making Doctor Strange, I was determined that that would not be the way that movie would fail. Right. If, if, if there were plenty of ways for it to fail, but I was like, it won't feel it fail that way. So you, and what you, what I literally had to do was I created a document for every shooting day that just had for every shooting day that I was on the movie that had the central emotional narrative story points for this character, because I knew that, that when I, when I was shooting it, that, that all of my time would be spent talking to people about about uh, practical issues yeah. and where the camera goes and 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 how how we can get this done in time and all of that and it's so easy to lose that um, because you don't have time to be working through that much on a on a movie of this size and so every day I would go in and I would remind myself what is the I would start by reading at the top of my script what I just pitched to Your you own, yeah. it's a psychotropic whatever it was psychotropic you know mind trip action movie about one man overcoming himself. Just to remind myself, I'm, that's what I'm making, yeah. and and then to really focus on that with the characters, and and really understand here's the emotional quality of what this guy and the people around him are going through, and uh, and I never lost sight of that while making Doctor Strange, and and the reason why that's so important is people pay to go see these movies because they see the trailer and they see the spectacle and they love Marvel, whatever. But when they get in there, it, it the reason it works is because of an emotional connection to those actors. Yeah. It's always the ceiling for how good a movie can be. A movie cannot be better than your lead character's story and performance. Can't. It's impossible. It doesn't matter how great everything else is. If your lead actor's character and performance are not um, emotionally satisfying, 
uh, the movie's not good. If they, if it, if, if that is satisfying, it's amazing how many things can be, cannot work and the movie will still work for you. And that's why you push back the release date to get Benedict Cumberbatch in your movie. Precisely, you know, because, because he, he just had a quality that I felt um, for this particular character that he would be able to uh, cover the range of emotions and the cockiness and the arrogance and, and still maintain likability because he is such a prick in the beginning of the movie as he yeah. was in the comics, you know? And, he and, being Stephen Strange, not Benedict Cumberbatch. Yeah, no, no, <laughs> he being Stephen Strange. Benedict is lovely. I love him. He's, he's really a, genuinely a great, a great guy. But yeah, it, so you, you, you got to get the right actors in those roles and you've got to stay focused on that, you know? And not, Do you think and not of yourself sorry. as mostly a storyteller? Is that your task or is it something broader than that? Um, I, I think that, I think it's broader than that because I think cinema is broader than that. You know, I do, I, I do think that a story itself is important because the story says something that only a story can, it can't, it can't, what is, what makes a good story, a, a good story is that it can't be reduced to something else. It can only what it what it is communicating can only be communicated through that story. So you have to be a good storyteller. But I think that's you know for me, and this is how I feel about movies I watch as well as the movies I make. Cinema is something broader than just that. It's a major component. Perhaps it's even the spinal column of the animal of a movie. But the flesh and blood of cinema is something um, to me that is more artful and uh, ineffable, that there's a quality to, a dreamlike quality to the cinema experience of submitting yourself to the immersion in this alternate reality um, that, that, that supersedes, you know, the individual, that supersedes the art forms of just music and, and photography and uh, blocking like theater and the storytelling of literature because it is a combination of all those things and the end result is still greater than the sum of its parts. Are you a fan of live theater also? Not really. Yeah. You know, and, and, and I think the reason... I, I sense that by what yeah, you Yeah, no, saying. I really, yeah, I really, I'm here. really very hard on theater, you know, because I, um, I, I find the experience so, so limiting compared to cinema. I would much rather watch... Uh, uh, you know, uh, I'd rather watch a mediocre movie than uh, a good play, right. but a, a great play, sure. you know, can certainly be a, a, an experience that's unlike anything else. When I saw Hamilton, you know, for example, it's like, well, this is one of the great works of art in, in of, of the last hundred years. And, yeah. and, and I experienced it and understood why. Um, but, but I think that cinema is, is a kind of experience that uh, is, as close to dreamlike magic that we get when it comes to art and entertainment, you know? I think that they're different. I mean, I, I was just in um, London a couple of weeks ago and we got to see Ian McKellen as King Lear at the Duke of York right. Theatre, right? And so it was an interesting experience, not only because he's fantastic, but because you're familiar with him from movies. Right. And now he's 20 feet away from you being King Lear. And there's things that obviously a live theater performance can cannot do that cinema can, but I think vice versa also, right? And I think that uh, I, maybe comparing them is wrong. I just thought of it because you were talking about the history a little bit, and I think of cinema as coming out of live theater back in the day. For sure. But it's, you know, it's had a hundred some years to develop, and it's, it's, it's able to do things now that live theater can't even imagine. Yeah, and I think that... that uh the theater that I do enjoy tends to be, you know, more minimalistic. I, I will always enjoy a good Shakespeare play because, because it's some of the greatest writing in human history. Uh, and, and if it's, if it's well-made and well-acted, that's going to be a, an extra, extraordinary experience no matter what. So what I don't like is spectacle theater. Yeah. Okay. And part of, it's one of the reasons why I liked Hamilton because I loved, I loved just entering in and seeing, Oh, this is just an empty stage, you know, with a pretty, pretty simple backdrop. And, and, and the experience was the music, the movement, you know, these things that are inherently theatrical, uh, when it came to, you know, I mean, people, I'm going to step on toes, but it's like, you know, see the big phantom, uh, you know, uh, chandelier hovering over the audience. I just think it's ridiculous. Cheesy. I, I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm like, why, you know, I, I can, I can pay $8 and, you know, at a movie, at a movie matinee and see something 
a thousand times greater than this, you know, right now. <laughs> and do you think that gives that, that, that an immersive quality of cinema gives it th this particular art form a way to get and connect with people's emotions and, you know, sort of a visceral response that other methods don't? I do. I do. I think, I think that it, it is primarily emotional. I think that, that in it, I think that it is holistically emotional. I think that that's maybe, it's hard for me to describe it because I usually don't have to. Um, but there is a, soulful, holistic, emotional quality to the cinema experience that I do believe transcends the, the, the nature of the experience of any other individual kind of art. And, um, and, it, and it speaks to our subconscious in a way that other art forms don't, um, and especially directors who are aware of that and can, and can utilize that well. I just think that, that it's the greatest art form, you know, and it's the only, only because it's the amalgam of all the other great art forms. It's the amalgam of photography and, and literature and theater and, um, and music. And, and when, and when all those things come together into something that is pure and creates a pure experience, the, the emotional power of it can be overwhelming, you know, and, and, uh, and for me, even a bad movie has a quality of that that I still prefer to, you know, and, and the closest thing to it, I think, is probably music, you know, in, in the way that it can um, can move you and transcend your your experience. And, 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 and I'm an avid reader, so there's right. no disrespect for, for sure. literature or, or formal art. But, but in this approach, it's, it makes perfect sense when you say that, that one of your favorite genres would be the horror movie, right? I yeah. mean, that's a kind of connection. You don't see that many horror plays, right? right. <laughs> it's hard to get scared in a, in a, in a, in a play um, because you, you need that, the intimacy of, of, uh, of, of being lost within your own within your own imagination and within your own fears and certainly horror literature works great. You know, right. good horror, a good scary Stephen King book scares you, you know, but not in the same way that a horror movie does. Yeah. You know, you don't usually read even a great chapter in the shining and physically feel your pulse race, you know, as you do in a good horror film where you, you get actually really scared. And, uh, and, and it, that's, that's what, and I think that cinema can do that, you know, this is something, this is something I'm just going to add in here on, while we're on Please. the subject, because it, it, we're talking about the nature of movies themselves and like, what are movies? And I think one of the real clues to what makes m movies special is the categorization of movies, because you've got, um, action movies, horror movies, dramas, comedies, um, thrillers, uh, and then you've got things like doc documentaries, but, um, science Long fiction, time. even. What's that? Rom-coms? Yeah, yeah. But, but those are, yeah, that's still still in the comedy section. Okay. It's a bran branch out under the comedy banner. These major categories, they're the same now on Netflix as they ever, they always were in Blockbuster. And I had this revelation one day when I was, uh, I, I think, a student, um, film student. And I was going into a Blockbuster video somewhere and I was looking at them. And I, it just, the thought hit me, who created these categories? Who created these categories? Like this, this is... These have been the categories that I've known right. movies to be under my whole life. And the more I thought about it, I thought, well, the audience created these categories. The audience, by, by wanting to see these different kinds of movies that separated into these like seven or eight major categories. And what I realized is what they really are is they're the major categories of human emotion. Mm. You know, fear for horror. Um, uh, you know, comedy for laughter, joy, drama for sorrow, for, you know, deeper feelings, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the visceral, uh, excitements is action. Yeah. Uh, anxiety is thriller, you know, science. And I think science fiction is always has, a, is always built upon a sense of wonder, mm -hmm. of wonderment combined usually with some other genre. And, and I think that, um, that this is, uh, these basic speaking to these basic human emotions is the nature of cinema. It's just what it does, it's what movies do. So there's an obvious question that I'd like to get your take on. Why do people go to horror movies? Why do people want to be scared? Like, why would you actually pay money for someone to make you feel unpleasant in some sense? Uh, a lot of people don't, you know, and, and I think that the people who do, you know, they like it for the same reason they like roller coasters is it's the, the, the uh, powerful, feeling of fear, which I think is arguably the most powerful human emotion and to feel, to, to experience the, um, the visceral power of that emotion in an environment where, you know, you're safe, 
like in a roller coaster, you know you're not going to fly out of the car, but you feel like you're going to fly out of the car. Right. And, and, and so you're expen- experiencing the adrenaline rush of that. Um, and then for people who are serious horror fans and, and people like me who, who consider it you know, uh, one of the undervalued great forms of movie art, um, it's that it gets to uh, some of the most important human questions about good and evil, about uh, metaphysics, uh, you know, uh, questions of the afterlife um, uh, and, um, and the meaning of existence and, and how, uh, how unspoken and unspeakable fears can be tapped into by great horror. Like right. the, these are all made. These are things that I love. You know, I speak, I'm, I'm waxing poetic about it, you know, because I, because I do, I love it. I love it and I revere it and I think it's important, but I also completely understand and have no, I have nothing negative to say to some people who just don't like that. And sure. so, so if somebody doesn't, doesn't like that experience, they don't like it. And my, and by the way, have spent having spent my entire adult life making horror films there is no such thing as a horror type you know it's like you you know, I, i've met some of the bravest cops in new york city who are terrified to watch a horror movie and would never <laughs> do it like guys who drag people out of the towers on 9 11 yeah you know and 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 have risked their lives over and over again you know and they're just like just don't show me any of that stuff you know and then and i'll meet a little old lady in a flower shop who's, you know, seen every Nightmare on Elm Street movie, <laughs> you know, so it just loves them. Something human, but it's hard to predict what yeah, it is. It's very hard to predict, like. yeah. But I, wanted, I do want to get into um, these metaphysical presuppositions. I mean, I think for you, questions of evil and um, purpose and meaning in life come into why you do horror, but maybe also why you do other movies also. It, it's, it's why I've... And we disagree about the metaphysical. We do. We have. It's session. one of the things Friendly that I disagree. That's it's, okay. It's one of the things I've loved about our relationship is that we've we've spoken about this many times. You know, I have, we have very differing views of of um, the nature of existence itself. You know, but but we've always admired and appreciated the other person's point of view and uh, and and um, respect. Uh, you know, the fact that that both of those views are very personal and powerful to us as individuals. You know, they inform everything else that we do in our work and the way we think about everything from, you know, practical life politics, right down to the meaning of our, of our, of our own life. And for me, it, I do think that, um, everything that I've done, perhaps the through line in all the work that I've done, including all the script work of, on, on things that have not, um, you know, been produced is, a combination of this sort of love for genre, you know, for horror, thriller, action type sci-fi movies and some kind of crossover into metaphysical questions, you know, questions about the nature of, of human existence and, and the possibilities of what life could be. And, um, certainly the moral questions that arise is that's one of the interesting things to me about horror is it's, almost it's very difficult to make an amoral horror film you know uh, or a non-moral you right. know horror film there's going to be a moral one way or the other you the, mo- the movie even if it seems uh, to have no moral center that becomes a moral point well and, good and, and evil are out there good right? and evil are, are like out there and so once you're dealing with horror you're you're landing in terrain that is inherently so philosophical it's yeah. inescapable yeah. and i think it's inescapable in a way that it's not in other genres and and so I think that was uh, was a big part of the pull too. That and the fact that that um, there's a lot of room to improve the genre and has been in my life. And I've really watched it happen. I'm watching it happen. You know, right. there's a it was a, more sophistication now. I think that that horror in the uh, in the in the eighties in the seventies and eighties was just slasher movies. Like that's all anybody ever thought about. You know, but but in, uh, with the exception of masterworks by great non-horror directors like Kubrick making The right. Shining or Friedkin making The Exorcist or something like that. But but I think that now um, it's a genre that has uh, gained a lot of respect for, for for how it comments on on the human experience. Yeah, you know? I mean, I remember being, uh, I loved Sinister and I thought it was extremely scary. And I'm not an aficionado by any means, but since then, The Babadook is yeah. an amazingly good movie. And just now we've started watching... Uh, 
the haunting of Hill House. I, we, we were just talking about that on the way Ooh. here because we saw we saw the well. And by the way, I, we, we saw that uh, the billboard, and, and uh, I asked Cargill. I said, "Have you heard anything?" And he said, "I hear it's very good." And it's Mike Flanagan. I tweeted about the release of that yesterday, and I haven't seen it yet. But he is such a good director, so good, and he is so talented. And of course, the, I've read the book. The Shirley Jackson novel is, is is amazing and really scary. Yeah, um, and all, which goes back to the original Haunting by Robert Wise, which was you know. Um, a, a great movie, and and it's uh, you know these these kind of tales, um, regardless of your uh, you know cosmological view of of you know, and regardless of your philosophical presuppositions about about the existence of of the immaterial world or the or the existence of anything non material, these movies speak to. Um, to uh, our fears, they just yeah. do. The, and in the a movie like that, and in other in movies you've made, there's there's obviously a supernatural element, but the response of the human characters to what they're seeing is what it would be, right? Or that's right. that's what counts. Like right. you, like I would totally feel this way in this circumstance, which right. I don't believe will ever happen because I'm an atheist. But you know, <laughs> if it did, that's how I would feel. That's what matters, right? Well, yeah, and 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 it's funny because I think that even if um, even if you're right and I'm wrong about the nature of the universe, uh, the likelihood of something coming along, you know, in the course of, of history that is, that, that, that undoes all of our safe, uh, uh assumptions about the nature of the world is going to be frightening. <laughs> it, that will, that, like yeah. that encountering that will be scary. Exactly. You yeah. know, and I think, and I think it's, I think one, one of my favorite things that you, I, I remember hearing you talk about is how, uh, you know, these sort of big revelations in science, are typically um, non-intuitive. Yeah. And, exactly. and you know, rel- relativity. I mean, what could be more non-intuitive than relativity? You know, and, and it takes so much effort just to try to conceptualize and understand what that, I- what that even is. And the fact that somebody figured it out, to me, is still incredible. I still don't understand how that happened. And honestly, happened. quantum mechanics is 100 times worse. The, the opening line of my new book is going to, I, I hope, is, is right now something like... Uh, you don't need a PhD in theoretical physics to be afraid of quantum mechanics, but it doesn't hurt. <laughs> oh, see, that's great, and 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 I think I, I just think that that uh, um, it all gets back to the mystery of the unknown, and I think that that's something where you and I have always had a, 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 an unspoken overlapping respect, which is there's there's a lot that we know, but there's there's so much that we don't know. You know, and there's so much that that's still out there to surprise us. Yeah, you know? that's and, right. and and that's so much of the human experience, not just in uh, 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 when it comes to knowledge and you know what we what we uh, know and what we believe about the universe, but that's our day to day experience. Life surprises us, right. and it scares us, and it does it throws us these curveballs. You know, and and I think that uh, this particular realm of visual storytelling is a great way to reckon with those fears. Yeah. And you've made a couple movies about exorcisms. Yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but you think that this is a real thing, right? I mean, that there is well, at least yeah. plausible, let's say. It, well, here's, here's the interesting thing. Here, here, it, it's funny because I, I didn't expect you to bring that up, but now that you have, I'm really glad you did. Because what I, what I can say about it um, is, again, the, the, the primary word I would use to describe my own feeling about the phenomenon is mystery. There's a great mystery to it. But possession and exorcism is a fact. It's, a, it's an anthropological reality that exists in all cultures and always have. People get into these crazy mindsets, you know, and, and start doing these things with certain predictable patterns. And then there's this kind of shock therapy ritual that every culture has developed that is often very effective, you know. And so for me, that's the starting point. The starting point of what makes it so interesting isn't theological it's anthropological right you know that this is a part of this is something that happens and, and in fact no in one the, can it, deny that in the real world exorcists go to people's houses because they believe that they are possessed and things happen precisely and i think that and i think that if you know and i've read dozens of books on the subject including very skeptical books and i think i think at the very least you have to if you look at credible cases when when i say credible i mean well researched you know well um uh, analyzed cases and certainly when you look at it as a phenomenon globally and historically i do think there is a trance state quality of it um in in in, in the more extreme cases of what i would what i would call a legitimate case is at the very least that Right. And, and, and therein you are entering into something very mysterious about the human mind 
at the very least, you know? And, and so I, um, I found that compelling. And when I first made the exorcism of Emily Rose, I have a, um, an open and liberal enough view of, of, um, of scripture, for example, you know, and, and, and my, my own theological views of things. And I'm always challenging myself to, 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 um, question what I, what I believe. One of the reasons I went into that was to see if, do I, do I believe that there's anything <laughs> behind this? Do I believe that the devil exists? It's yeah. just all just a construct, yeah. you know? And in that particular case, what was so fascinating was by the time it was over, I didn't have any more answers than I went into going in because there really didn't seem to be any simple way to explain what happened to that particular girl in that case. Like no matter what angle I looked at it from, it was just confounding. And that's why it was, it sparked, sparked so much interesting conversation. But I, but I, I will finish by saying that, um, I think that the vast majority of what you see and hear out there, people, you know, attributing to being demon possession and, and the, the work of the devil is nonsense. You know, it's like, it's the vast majority of it is, is, is absolutely r- ridiculous, you know? And, and, it, and, and the more extreme cases, uh, you know, I, I could be wrong. Maybe, maybe it's all some kind of psychological trans state, you know, but, but I personally, do I believe that there's a spiritual component behind it? I do. Yeah. yeah. And you know, there's no question. Well, there's very little question, I guess there's always some question, but it seems to be useful in describing human actions to believe in the existence of evil. Some things just are evil. Yeah. And how, and there's a lot of evil going on in your films. Um, how would your films be different if tomorrow you became a naturalist? <laughs> oh, that's a really good question. Um, they, I, you I mean, know, it's obviously not a, it's a no. It's a really, really, really good question. I like the question a lot. Um, I mean, they would be completely different because they would be made from a completely different human experience. Right. You know, my um, my uh, spirituality you know, if I'm honest, has been, you know, certainly scrutinized intellectually. I certainly take philosophy very seriously. Mm-hmm. I've changed a lot of what I believe because of critical thinking and, and, and all of that. But if I'm honest, my my core belief system is born of my experience. Right. I wasn't raised in a religious home, but it was it has always been my nature from the time I was a, a small child to look around and and feel the world as something that is much more than the material in front of me. I've always felt that the world was, that what was real was more than this. And maybe what was primary was, was more than this, you know, something else, not even more, but just something else that, that I've always experienced the world more immaterially than I have materially. And that's just my, been my, my way of experiencing it. And so, um, so I connect that, that part of myself that experiences the world uh, in, in that mystical kind of way, I, I, I relate to cinema in, in, as, as a part of that. I relate to the fil- to film experience as a, as a viewer and as, uh, as an artist is very, very connected to that. So I think that, um, uh, and, and, and when it comes to philosophy, you know, where you would land, you know, much more with Hume, um, I'm yep. going to land much more with crazy Kant, you know, and, 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 you know, <laughs> oh, no, sorry, that's the deal breaker. Yeah, sorry, I don't know if we I can know, get along anymore after but, that. But I, you know, I'm, I'm right with him when he says there's two <laughs> things I'm sure about the stars above me and the moral law within. Yeah. And so I think that that, I think that I do think that that belief in a moral law pre-existing within human behavior is something I do believe in. But if I were to become a naturalist and undo even that, um, I don't, I, I, I feel like suddenly this, like when you ask me that question, the honest answer is, <laughs> well, you, I couldn't make any of the movies that I've made at all. I the, wiped the slate clean. And, um, and, uh, what would I make? I'd have to live another life, right. you know? And, and, and if, and if that actually, and by the way, it's possible that something could happen that would make me Absolutely. think that way. And, and what would the result be? I think that all I could make movies about, if that happened to me at this point in my life, all I could make movies about are, is, is that, about the shock value of, of, of experiencing life so long and so powerfully 
uh, for for five decades, and then to suddenly have the rug pulled out from under you. No, you I know? think that's perfectly fair, and and vice versa. Like yeah. if some if I had a conversion experience tomorrow, yeah, well, uh, oh my god, would, what are you going to do? I would not be able to write about quantum mechanics and anymore. And, 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 it would be the most important thing in your life. And right? this makes me such a bad Christian too, because I hear you say that and I'm like, oh god, I hope that doesn't happen to John. <laughs> <laughs> me, I like Sean the, the way world is more that's interesting like, with the variety, right? Exactly right? Yeah, no, right. we're not trying to convert each other. That's, that's a good thing, but. Uh, but it does, you know, I think that the relationship with mystery is an interesting thing. You brought it up. Um, mystery is crucially important to all movies, yeah. uh, to all storytelling, to human existence, et cetera, et cetera. I was really annoyed by the famous J.J. Abrams mystery box TED Talk. Did you see yeah, this TED Talk? Yeah, I did. I did see it. And part of it, and maybe I'm being unfair, but part of it seemed to me to be, and maybe we'll disagree about this, that he was saying that mysteries are better if, are better, best, only good if you don't even try to solve them in some sense, right? Like uh, if you assume that they're not solvable and keep them as mysteries. And to me, mysteries are great because they can be solved. I mean, I go through life presuming that, of course, there's a million questions I don't know the answers to, and I will die before I know all the answers to them. But in principle, I could get them, and that's what makes the quest worthwhile. Well, certainly when you're talking about the mysteries of, of, um, of the material world and the mysteries of science, that's a given, you know, what we don't know about dark matter and, and, uh, dark energy and, you know, these things that in gravity, these things that, that science is still chasing. Um, of course we have to believe that they can be answered, that, that those mysteries can be unsolved. And, and just as relativity changed our, our human experience of the world, um, the, I'm sure future discoveries and, right. and quantum mechanics is already starting to do that as it seeps out into popular culture. It's starting to affect the way that we feel most, a lot of, a lot of times in very sloppy ways and, and stories I, I know. But, um, but I think that, that when you're talking about mystery, um, the mystery of human experience and the mystery of, uh, say the mystery of God, of the concept of God, the right. mystery of, of, um, meaning, um, to me, th there's always a quest to comprehend it. You know, there's always a quest to, 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 to get deeper underneath it. That is the point. I don't believe that, that there's power in just um, acknowledging, oh, it's a mystery we'll never know. Well, if that's the case, I don't need to think about it. Um, I love, um, I don't remember where I first heard this, but I've repeated it before. Um, I, maybe I, maybe I, Maybe I said it. I, don't, I don't really don't remember. <laughs> but it's certainly something I think about a lot, which is that, to me, the concept of mystery is not the presence of something meaningless, but the presence of more meaning than we can yet comprehend. You know, that, that, that there's an awareness of there's more here than we can get our experience or our brains or our hearts around. And, um, and the whole point of evolving as a species, evolving as an individual, is to get deeper into that mystery, start to understand it, you know, what's there, what is it, what, what, what is, what is it there for, you know, and I think that, that, um, the important thing to me though, that is worth protecting. And I didn't particularly agree with JJ's approach on the mystery box either, but what I do believe with respect to mystery is that it, we have to make a practiced kind of discipline to not think that we understand more than we do. I think that's, oh, yeah, sure. I think that's really important. And I right. think it's important because I think, and I've said this many times before, but I think both science and religion, you know, have been guilty and continue to be guilty of sort of fil sort of uh, propagating the idea that we understand a lot more than we really understand, you know, and they've both done it in very different ways, mm -hmm. but they're broadcasting a, a sensibility to, to their constituents, you know, that uh, we got the world figured out. Well, one you know? of the terrible things about the way that we teach kids science is that we teach it as a set of facts that we've learned rather than as a process for making hypotheses and then testing them against reality. That statement alone is something that I, people don't understand. Yeah. People don't think of science as a process. Right. They yeah. don't. It's not they, that hard. They, 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 they think of it as, ir, ir, as, as irrevocable fact. That's yeah. it. And, yeah. and well, and sometimes it is revoked. You oh, know, yeah, exactly. it's like yeah, <laughs> a lot, the like, exactly. That's that, right. the whole history of science has, has been a process of it, of it sort of undercutting itself um, in, as it gets deeper into it, its understanding of how complex the world really is. 
All right, we can move into the lightning round because I know that you have to go to see a horror house, right? Yes, yeah. Gonna, we're, we're, I'm meeting uh, <laughs> meeting uh, my kids at uh, at Katsuya, and then we're going to uh, uh, we're going to go to the Warner Brothers uh, horror tour. Very consistent, yes. excellent in your <laughs> philosophical approach. Um, so, but ver- then very quickly, because uh, I do want to talk about. I mean, you're not just a director, but you're a you are a lover of cinema and the history of cinema. Yeah. I mean. What is your relationship to that history and what would you recommend to our listeners out there in podcast land? Like, you know, should they download Kurosawa on Netflix? Oh, such would a great that be question. the best? You know, my, my relationship to it is that, you know, I first learned, um, you know, movies from my, my father primarily because he was a movie lover, but he was, stru- lo- he was straight genre, you know, a- he, not, not horror either, but he just loved action movies. He loved, uh-huh. you know, thrillers. And so I grew up seeing tons of movies american movies we we see two three movies a day sometimes in our family that's great and so i developed a real love for movies and and uh and then of course when when uh video technology came in i started to rewatch movies all the time but then when i got to college i was exposed to international cinema and and it was really my discovery of the art of international cinema that that made me really want to be a filmmaker mm. and, and because i the first time that i saw fellini's eight and a half i just I actually had a panic attack at the end of the movie. I, I, the density of that experience, the dream quality of that film was so overwhelming. I, I, I kind of panicked. I had yeah. literally left the classroom because I, I couldn't, I couldn't uh, uh, understand. The immersive experience. It, I couldn't understand what was happening to me in, in, in my brain in, in, in this experience. And, and, and then as I re- continued to rewatch it, the, the, you know, the layers of, of meaning and poetry in that, in that movie were so amazing. And I, I didn't know like movies can do this, right. you know? And so, uh, that sent me really down the rabbit hole of exploring, um, all the major movements in world cinema, you know, uh, going for starting with the silent era in, in American cinema, you know, and going all the way through the ver- various, uh, major movements, you know, and it was, it was primarily Japanese cinema and European art, cinema mm-hmm. that, that, you know, uh, the French new wave and, and Italian new realism, um, these things really spoke to me. And Kurosawa is a great point for people who are, have limited exposure to international cinema. Um, Kurosawa was a great starting point because he took, I think the sensibility of Hollywood movies, the entertainment value of Hollywood movies and merged it with the artfulness of European movies of his time. Right. You know, he was as much a fan of John Ford as he was yeah. of Igmar Bergman, you know? And so there's a quality to his movies that are high art and high entertainment at the same time that you really don't get with many directors ever. And, and so he's a great starting point, you know, watch, watch the, you know, just Google the 10 best Kurosawa movies and every one of them will be a a masterpiece worth, worth watching. But you also have to find the directors that you love, you know, it's like John, you know, Godard, John Godard is not for everybody, but for those of us who like love those movies or Bergman, like Bergman movies, you, you know, you and I, it was so interesting. Like I would love to watch a Bergman film with you because he really believed in a godless universe. He believed yeah. in a, he believed in, 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 a, in, in no God or at the, if there is a God, it is certainly silence. It's certainly non-communicative. Right. We are alone, you know? And, and even though I've never held that view, I experienced his experience of the world through those movies so powerfully. And this is what movies can do, I think, again, in, in ways that other art, art forms don't, is they can, well, other art forms do the same thing, but for me, movies do it in a way nothing else does. I feel that experience. I feel right. his human experience through those movies. And, um, and I am made more human for having felt it and for having understood it and having a related to the truth quality in it. Because even though I have a system of belief that is different than that, I know what it's like to feel alone in the world. I know what it's like to to, to not feel uh, safe in in a, in a in a in in, in a world, uh, and I know certainly what it's like to be racked with doubt, which a lot yeah. of his films were. About and I think that's well. something that we both agree on, and probably Bergman would agree with us, is that the question of whether or not God exists matters. It's exactly, not irrelevant. <laughs> exactly. No, and I I, th- I think that's exactly right. And I think that that uh, you know we live in an age now of just you know shouting, people everybody shouting at each at, at each other and. Uh, and, and, you know, one of the things I love is being able to have conversations like this and, and, and hear something like that from somebody like you, that that question is an important question. It's a profound question. It's, it's one of the essential questions and, and it needs to be reckoned with, you know, and, 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 uh, um, that's more important than, 
to me, hearing that is a much more important voice than anybody advocating why they believe what they believe. You know, the starting point is we all need to deal with certain realities of uh, we have to answer certain questions if we are to live a, a, full, a full life, an right. enlightened life. We should. We should be. We should have an understanding of of what we think the human experience really is. Okay, two more questions. The right. lightning round. Uh, for whatever reason, you're told that you can make one more movie ever in your life. What would it be? Hmm. You're allowed to change your mind later, but. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> it would be the next movie that I'm going to make, but I can't say anything about it. That's fair. Is that a safe, okay, that a safe, that that a safe is, answer? That is the correct answer. That is the correct okay. answer. We, we made everybody happy. You're going to make a movie. Good. Right? Yeah. That's, no, and it's true. You're living and, and, the life. You know, and, and it, I, I do believe in it because I, 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 made, I made one decision early in my career, you know, to, to take a big studio movie because that's what you do, you know, when you're a young filmmaker, if you get the opportunity, you take it. And, and I ended up regretting that decision. And, and since then, I've always operated uh, under the belief that I, I should make every movie as though it's my last movie. Good. Yeah. Because one day it will be. Exactly, right. <laughs> you know, that's... and, and you, don't, you never know when that's going to happen. Well, you believe happen. in the afterlife. I presume that there are directors <laughs> in heaven or hell. I don't know. <laughs> maybe they're, to hell. they're only producers yeah, in hell, right. maybe. I don't yeah, know. That's, that's what it is. All the producers in hell, writers and directors. Directors go to limbo. Writers go to heaven. That's correct. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And the last one is uh, you are out there on Twitter yeah. pissing people off saying things uh i mean you don't try to piss people off i don't think that's your goal but you're happy to say things truthfully honestly right and uh and i'm on twitter yeah also uh where people always debate you know it's not twitter in particular but just um should we all just shut up right like should we protect ourselves should we lower the noise level and just not talk but i find it very stimulating uh you know i try to put people in my twitter feed who are rewarding yeah. like people who talk about twitter as just a you know a source of terrible things i'm like you get to choose who you follow yeah. like so what is your relationship with that sort of more social aspect of i mean i i you job? know i left i left twitter for a couple months um just to to feel the noise kind of calm down and 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 to reevaluate my belief in it and i came back and i came back because i do value it i do find it to be uh rewarding both uh, you know, by controlling my Twitter feed and who it is that I'm actually going to uh, listen to, and and um, and and having the lists of people who I in, in a particular mood. Well, right. I want I want to I want to see what this list has to Sometimes say. Sometimes I just want to hear about the NBA. I don't right, hear- right, exactly. <laughs> yes. But I but I think as a user, um, you know, it's certainly been enlivening in that I've met a lot of great people as a result of it. You know, I've made a lot of, of good connections. But I I love it as as a, as a, as a, as a form of expression. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not out there to try to influence anybody or change anybody's mind about anything, you know? Um, so I'm not trying to, I don't want to shout into the void about, you know, what I'm angry about. And, and I, I've tweeted plenty about Trump. Um, but usually just because it's an expression of this is how I am feeling today right. about this lunatic. An and, expressive and, act. Yeah. And, and, and I also am scaling back on that. I'm trying to do less and less of that, but I love it as, as just an, a, an opportunity to, um, you know, to, uh, express, you know, what I think and feel about things. And for me, it's usually cinema, uh, and a little bit with politics, but Cargill and I spoke about this last night and cargo has been actively, using his Twitter feed to tweet specifically about writing, about the craft of writing. And he was saying to, cause I said to him last night, I said, what do you think I should be doing differently with my feed? You know, cause I, I am getting a little bored with, with the whole world of it. And he was encouraging me to tweet more about the craft of craft. directing. Yeah. And I thought, you know, that's really true because no one's doing that. Yeah. And, uh, and I can do that. And I think that that will have, will have value and I think I'll enjoy it. And I love teaching, yeah. you know, the, and, and that's something where I can actually give valuable information that very few people have. And nobody on Twitter is really doing that. Well, it makes perfect sense maybe, but it seems like there's a vibrant screenwriting Twitter in a way that there's not a vibrant director. Twitter. Absolutely true. Yeah, absolutely true. I think I think uh, uh, I, and I think that's unfortunate. I think it you know it should be that way. I think I think 
think there should be a better. If I can chime in for a second, you can you, see Robert Cargill. And you, you, you take a medium in which you're supposed to write, and then you put writers in it, and what do you expect? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I mean, I'm that's married the, to a journalist. There, there they you cannot go. stop on Twitter. <laughs> yes, scientists are much more reluctant. But uh, all right, that all makes a lot of sense. This is extraordinarily uh, fun and insightful. So Scott Derrickson, thanks so much. Oh, for my being pleasure, on the Sean. Thank you.